I'm totally of the opinion that everybody can be an artist. You know, when you make the decision, like, hey, I am an artist. It's something that just happens and you just like decide to do it. At the same time, I've never really feel like I'm a real artist. And it's not, it's, I'm not talking about imposter syndrome or anything like, it's just like, you're just like, a making art is just, it's a fun hobby. And, uh, and I kind of still have that attitude towards it. But not to become too precious, I guess. Because I, I, I think my mind cannot take it to start feeling precious about myself. Then, you know, like going to full, full megalomania. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ragnar Kjartansson and I am a visual artist. All my work is a lot of it based on performance and uh, performance and painting, I would say. Yeah. And then it goes to video and all kinds of stuff. So I, I grew up in the theater and, uh, and art became a part of my life very much also through my grandfather, who was a sculptor. So I was just being exposed to visual art it always felt like it just was so free and cool somehow. This is my studio here in, in Granden in Reykjavik. It's, an, it's a, like a, a line of buildings which were built as, a, as a, what do you call it? Modernist uh, boat shacks. That's why it's like, it's like this thick concrete to take on just like the North Atlantic Ocean just against the building and that's why it's designed to for the wave to come over it here on the floor is a watercolor painting i'm working on called uh, is a series of paintings i just continue to do they just make me they just make me happy uh, it's just like night skies called the die nacht der hochzeit the night of the wedding it's like sun's good in German. It's one of the best tricks I learned in, in the painting department in art school from this painter Sigurður Árni. And I asked Sigurður Árni, like, how do you do a night sky? He was just like, oh, it's, I don't know. Uh, oh, it's the, the classic trick is to do, do purple and then black on purple. And ever since, like, I've just loved this trick because you always get like oh, this very poetic night sky from this trick of the trade. <laughs> I, when I decided to apply for art school, there was a lot of, uh, I remember my mother was basically you like, you know, okay, Ragnar, now you have to apply for theater school. <laughs> and uh, because I was always doing theater and I, and I loved it, but I always sensed that I was not a good actor. I couldn't act or uh, kind of lacked the this, you know, you just feel it when you like, you know, you don't have that fire. And, uh, but I was always an exhibitionist, I think. And I remember just thinking when I applied for visual art, I remember thinking like, yeah, maybe it's good to be an exhibitionistic visual artist. There are not so many exhibitionistic visual artists in Iceland. <laughs> so, you know, maybe I'm special if I'm... <laughs> I remember that thought. I also choose visual art because I was like very much into, I was in bands and really loved uh, making music and as kind of, and that, you know, you kind of learn from pop history, like all kind of mainly like European pop stars have always like started, com come from art school. So I was just like, okay, art school is the way to learn to be a pop musician. <laughs> Here are three guitars and uh, this one is a, is a, Stratocaster that was used a lot when I in a band I was in called Trabant. Some kind of it was kind of electro clash glam rock band. And this is a Swedish or German like kind of folk guitar. It's almost in tune. I think I actually kind of fell in, fell in love with the idea of video art through the works of Gillian Waring and uh, Arnold Meek. And I kind of was just like, 
I was in in love with the form through them and and just wanted to to do works like that and when, and then I just remember you know back then it was just like the 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 editing part in this it was just so complicated like to edit on a computer uh, that I was just like kind of daunted by it and that's why I started making videos that were just you know that you didn't have to edit du hast stjålet noch for mig din lille tyd din slavsvars dit møj svin the piece colonization is from 2003 and that is a piece where I am playing like an Icelandic peasant and my friend uh, Bindit Erlingsson, an actor, is playing a Danish merchant and the Danish merchant is just torturing the uh, Icelandic peasant in sort of, it's almost like in a kind of a, in almost like a Benny Hill setting. Uh, it's sort of, uh, and then in between there are shots of Copenhagen with like blood dripping over postcards of Copenhagen. It was, it was made for a show at uh, which Stalk Gallery was doing out in the countryside and the show was called Island in Denmark. A bit uh, before that, I, ha I, I had the experience that I, you know, that I was like, I was partying in Copenhagen, visiting a friend. And, you know, I was just totally drunk and, an, and a total asshole. And I uh, was like, I, they, I were, we were going to Veka and the uh, the bouncers didn't want to let me in, so I was just like, "Oh fuck you!" And I kicked the door, and then the the glass broke in the door. And instead of you know feeling ashamed, something clicked in me when probably when shame hit. Like then I just started being like, "Oh!" When they like took me like, "What are you doing?" and put me to the earth, I was like, I was like. Is this how you treat me? Are you gonna treat me like you treated my forefathers? <laughs> and I, and suddenly, instead of, you know, I became, I suddenly had this kind of post-colonial, you know, like thinking that like, you know, like I was some kind of a victim. They were like, because I was Icelandic and they were Danish bouncers. So then the Danish police put me into a, to a, to a prison cell for one night. And in retrospect, it was interesting that that this like you, that this kind of um, you know nation myth making makes like the idea like Icelanders you know the reason for Icelandic kind of nationality. There's so much the myth making that we were kind of, you know, colonial victims of Denmark. But maybe this story is more complicated than that also. And colonization is, is a piece which is, um, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't really know. You know, it's like, it takes a very weird stand. That's why I like it also still. It, it, I think it ages well <laughs> because it, it's just like, because it's about, I mean, there was pain, there was pain, in, but also there is like, has been this myth made about how horrible it was, which maybe it wasn't. Little sat, little sweet, hunnelot, sweet, sweet, This is a piece uh, I made in the 20th century. Says here Ragnar Kjartansson, 1999. And uh, it's my friends Gunnhildur, Sirra and Elin Helena. And uh, all awesome artists. And they are, it's just like kind of posing as the three muses of alcohol, tobacco and I don't know. <laughs> I, got, <laughs> I got very bad grades for this painting. It's just like, this is a very stupid painting Ragnar. <laughs> and here is a piece by Johannes Atle Hinriksson. He just became sort of a, a big thing in New York, like, you know, 20 years ago. And he was just like in New York and had two galleries and was just like making these like wah, wah, wah pieces. And then he was just like, 
Ah, oh, this is weird. I'm just leaving. And he just went home to Iceland and started working as a sailor. <laughs> it's a man being totally smashed and fucked up by this monkey. And and it's and he was just like explaining to me. He's like, you know, you know, addicts use a lot about this the monkey on the shoulder. Like, you know, you have to have your fix, or the monkey will like eat your face. And uh, and uh, but I kind of look at society as the monkey on my shoulder. Like, you know, if I don't pay my bills and and uh, kind of check on my check on my bank every month and pay taxes, like. Society will eat my face like the monkey on the shoulder. Oh, why do I keep on hurting you? Mercy was a piece which was originally made for a show in Belgium. I recorded this video there and was in this, and there was like just this red velvet curtain in the background. And so I, and this just had been a riff I'd been kind of playing again and again. This like, this, this sort of, count, ult, some kind of a ultimate country line. Like, why do I keep on hurting you? Why do I keep on hurting you? Why do I keep on hurting you? Oh, why do I keep on hurting you? Just from the early start of my works, I, I was, I think, in awe with country music. I have this kind of complicated character of like the country singer who's like kind of always some kind, he kind of burns everything around him, but he's always some kind of a victim. And all these characters in the videos, like like in a video like Mercy, like are often put on clothes and some kind of thing. But as I said, like I didn't go to acting school because I couldn't act. I'm I'm never a character in the videos. Although I dress up as the cliche of something, I am always just like myself singing that song. Why do I keep on hurting you? Because also it's personal, the song. Like, you know, it's also about the asshole I am. It's not just about like assholes in country music. <laughs> And it's just also like kind of self, self-reflectionary. Also, I remember as a, you know, as like when I was trying to be a musician and I slowly became an artist from being a musician was that when, when and it was also like around the turn of the century and like, you know, being here in Reykjavik where like, you know, Sigurós was becoming so big and it was all about being authentic. And me from a theatrical family, like I didn't, I didn't feel this authenticity. Like I like, I still don't feel, you know, I don't feel authentic. I'm just not an authentic human being. And I guess that is authentic about me, you know? And uh, so, so there's this kind of, there's always been this kind of Pessoa feeling in me that I, that I have no idea who I am. And, uh, and this was sort of a way to make music as a kind of, you know, like, you know, I'm just gonna b go into the cliche of this music and, you know, dress like it, but not like I'm dressing as this character. Oh, why do I keep on you? Uh, here's a lot of records, actually. And uh, I mean, I, I listen to music in, on all kinds of formats, of course, like any modern person would do. <laughs> and uh, when it's new music, it's mostly, of course, just, you know, Spotify or SoundCloud or iTunes. And, uh, but, but then I listen to a lot of records also, like, you know, it's kind of all over the place. This is like JD and AKA J Dilla. Welcome to Detroit. Welcome to Detroit. I learned so much about the approach to what art is through, uh, through music and through, uh, so kind of my, my godmother, Engel Lund, who was, uh, she was a, a singer of folk songs and leader 
she lived in our in our basement and she just had this really profound relationship with music and she was always talking about that a song is a song it's not the performer performing the song and you can never uh, and you should never uh, put your personality into the song. You just have to be the song. And I, and that's, that's just had a profound effect on me about kind of the essence of art as a song. And I kind of slowly discovered that there was more freedom in making music as performance art than making music as, uh, as music. Because when you made the music as performance art, then you were just totally free to do what you want and and the form could be how any you know and you know it's just not, not like okay I have to make a good song which will go on a record and maybe be performed in a concert it's just like the song is just can can become a sculpture and Valdo de los Rios is like this kind of easy listening king uh, that uh, But he's like very unlike James Lust, because James Lust is the other recent listening king, but James Lust put out 3,000 titles. But Valdo de los Rios put out very few, and he was from Argentina. And, uh, and it's, he's just so much more sophisticated than his German counterpart, James Lust. It's good to, to kind of add them, <laughs> like Picasso and Brack, <laughs> the, the great masters of the symphonic. Uh, Schmaltz music form, but uh, the uh, uh, but and Valdo de los Rios, he he just killed himself pretty young, like just the kind of the pressure of the pressure of life. He used to listen to it a lot when I was a teenager. I was like, haha, I, very ironically, this is funny, but it just grows on me. I don't stop listening to it. It's just awesome, awesome uh, versions of classical music. And this Ode to Joy, it just is better than, than Beethoven's version. Because Beethoven doesn't have a 12 string acoustic guitar and drums. Pretty awesome! <laughs> to wait a while for the drums to come in, but they will come. <laughs> when me and Pali were in Venice, like drinking and smoking and doing the end paintings, we listened so much to this. To be kind of half drunk and golden Venetian light and just blasting it. Awesome. Piece the end, which is like a, which is a, a fugue of paintings. <laughs> uh, they are basically a documentation of a performance I did with Paul Hugo Björnson, my collaborator, and he, and and friend. I did the Icelandic Pavilion in Venice in 2009, and the piece was just that you because the pavilion was then in this palazzo by the Grand Canal and was just so gorgeous that I, that the, the piece was just this kind of situational piece that you walked into this artist studio where the artist was constantly painting the model and smoking and drinking beer. And, and that piece was also sort of like, you know, living the cliche I wanted to, 
this artist I wanted to be, like to be constantly drunk, constantly smoking, doing oil paintings. And uh, so we were there for half a year and it was one painting a day of Palle in his swim trunk. And it was very much a piece very much kind of based on ideas from, from of feminist art from like Karoli Schneemann and Marin Abramovic about kind of, about identity. And it was really like, we were playing with the identity of just being dudes, being like men in that space. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and Palle also being, you know, the objectified male. It became very melancholic at the same time, like, you know, and this feeling of like constantly drinking and, uh, and smoking. It was really awesome for the first week. And then it became kind of disgusting. And, but we just, you know, we were, we were following the rules from the, from the art goddess about what, what we had to do. And I think the suffering was very important for the piece. And this ridiculous suffering. And, and, uh, and there was a lot of play on this kind of the macho painter. The piece was kind of, I remember because it was just after the crash and it was sort of a hopeful thing that I was like, I remember like and thinking that there was kind of the end of masculinity was coming. And this was sort of like a, this was a portrait of like some pathetic masculinity in this kind of golden Venetian light. But sadly, it wasn't the end, you know, <laughs> of the fucking masculinity shit. This is probably one of my favorite records. Like it's the, it's a it's it's a Billie Holiday's last album, Lady in Satin, and Billie wanted to do like a fancy record with like, and it's sort of I mean with all those kind of kind of big band records that like, you know, Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra were doing at the time. And, uh, and she went like full on with Ray Ellis and they created this crazy gorgeous swan song of her, like, you know, just close to her death, like singing in a, in, in heroin gaze with like sugary strings. It's just so gorgeous. It's one of these things, like, you know, always when it's like, it's funny when always when it's like, oh, best, greatest records of all times, it's always just like the Beach Boys or the Beatles, but like this kind of stuff always gets left behind. But these are like, like a record like this is just nuts. Once again, I fall into I wanted to shoot the video in a place called Rokeby Farm, where I had stayed a few years earlier. My friend Markus Thor Andersson, who is a curator now at the, at the Reykjavikamp Museum, but he, I was with him in art school. And, um, and, we, and we were, you know, very much kind of together in art. And then he decided to become a curator. He had befriended the people who uh, own Rokeby. It's, it's, it's one of this kind of the villas of the Gilded Age. It was built by the, built by, uh, of the generals fighting, fighting with Washington, John Armstrong. And I think it was, was started to being built in 1811, I think. And it kind of the place has stayed intact how it was when it was built in 1870s. The, the people who own it, Ricky and Anya, they, uh, they are just like characters from from, from a novel or an adventure, like totally larger than life, brilliant characters. And I just was always fantasizing about, you know, bringing a lot of friends there and living there like, you know, you were in a check of play.
And then this came this very banal idea, like, wouldn't it be cool to make a video piece there with uh, like musician friends of mine from the Reykjavik music scene. And we would just be up in Rokeby for a week and, uh, and uh, sort of create a piece which would be based on stuff I had been working on with David Thorjonsson, a frequent collaborator of mine. We did a piece called The End, Rock, which was like a piece which was a sister piece to The End paintings, which was a piece we did in the Rocky Mountains, where like us and the visitors, I was playing a lot with the idea of music being spatial and this kind of, that like, that you would mix the music with, by, with walking in the space. Like every, there would be video screens where the music was coming from and like, you know, if you go closer to the drums, it's more drums. And if you go closer to the cello, it's more cello. It's a sort of like that the, the viewer is sort of like, you walk around the screens like, you know, like how you lift knobs on a mixing desk. A diamond heart. The music was, was, was a collaboration very much with David Thorjonsson, who, who kind of smokes, is smoking a cigar and playing piano in the piece. And then we based the music on, uh, on, on like a song we had made when we were in a residency with Austi Sif Gunnarsdottir, uh, 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 and who was a really great performance artist. She made many, many performances, which were always this kind of mysteric, emotional, had this mysteric, emotional sentences. And this song was just like, I made a collage of like loads of sentences from her work. It's like some sentences are from this, for one video work, another sentence is from, from a performance she did, and another from, from a text she wrote. So like, it was just like me, like I had I'd written this melody, and then I was just thinking of all of words from her work that just like kind of came together as a collage. So, so the piece is really, it's like loaded with collaboration with a lot of people. Uh, I love when we showed it here in, in Reykjavik, there was like a, a critic I really admire very much called Dr. Gunni. He described it that he was like, he was not, he was just like, mm, I don't care. I don't get the fuss about this piece. Uh, it's just like, you know, Raki Kjartans and, you know, some, some musical musician friends being very drunk, playing pretty sloppy country. <laughs> and that's basically what it was. But there just did something happened when we were doing it, which is like kind of unexplainable. And it became, it became this uh, mega popular piece. It's like, it's a piece, you know, like as a visual artist, you don't like you don't never intend to make pieces that become like just popular, popular with people, like with people, like everybody likes it. It's like, and it's it's really fun to have done one piece like that. But you know, in my works, I'm not aiming for to to be a to. It's just really awesome to have done one. I think. <laughs> actually a collage that um, that Masha Alokhina of Pussy Riot made when she was here in the studio working on a show with me and Ingeberg and Dorothy Kirch, uh, which was the first overview of, uh, of uh, Pussy Riot's work in Russia uh, called Velvet Terrorism. And, uh, and this is just uh, a collage of like the power in Russia, how they reacted to their insanely gorgeous performance. And it's just like, you know, Suganov, the head of the Communist Party, 
saying national symbols are not to be joked with. I'd take a good belt and whip them. Uh, Mendedev saying, I am sick of what they have done and their looks. <laughs> and the hysteria that accompanies everything that has happened. And Putin saying like, oh, we gave them two years. I have nothing to do with it. Yeah, so the, the walls here are all from uh, basically uh, the, the, it's the um, it's from when I made the work terrible terrible and they were it's like it, it's it's a replica of like how the Tretchikov gallery in Moscow where where uh, where Ivan the terrible kills his son has been shown for 140 years <laughs> and uh, this was uh, this is like how it how it looked in 1913 circa about the color that was in 1913, and it's just still this weird museum orange from 1913. So this painting by Ilya Repin of Ivan the Terrible killing his son. I remember when my parents went to the Soviet Union on a trip, like when I was a kid, they were like away for a month, like going on a cultural visit to the Soviet Union. And they came back and my mom was just, you know, in Moscow, there is a painting that is the most powerful painting in the world. And it was so powerful that somebody tried to kill it. <laughs> and to see describing, you know, the painting of the, ho the horror and agony of Ivan the Terrible in the moment after he has killed his son. And, uh, and I think that description of, of that painting, it really, you know, we were talking earlier about like why, I, why I, I went into visual art. I think, I think that was really something went the light in me. And that painting has always stayed with me as this kind of ultimate kind of almost like artwork that has this kind of mystical powers. And it's also to look at it today because it's made by Ilya Repin, who's Ukrainian, and it's about the essence of the of the Russian Empire. That it just like kills the young and this kills constantly kills the future. And uh, and and then it has twice been attacked by Russian nationalists. Yeah, I was always blown away by this fact that a, a man, you know, attacked it in 1913 with a knife, crying blood, too much blood, too much blood. Weirdly, it was attacked again in 2018. And then an, another kind of nationalist took, took a museum pole and just like <laughs> threw it onto the painting and managed to break the glass and, and damage the painting again. But in both instances, they did not manage to damage like the, the insanely painful uh, eyes of Ivan the Terrible. But this, these two attacks are, there's something very sinister about them. And, and maybe it's like this kind of, I often think about this, this line, which is like kind of sweet from uh, Dean Martin's song. What's it called? You're nobody till somebody loves you. And, and there's this line where he sings like, the world still is the same, you'll never change it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and it's something about this, like, it's still the fucking same. It's just, you know, and we always go down to this, like, kind of dark nationalistic paths. Here's the uh, oil colors, the heart of uh, the artist's studio. And um, 
fine, fine turpentine. And like, it's just like, I think uh, this is just the best thing about being an artist, the smell of turpentine. And, and this is a very, this is a painting in a strange stage. Uh, it's of, uh, it's a self portrait with George Jones, kind of. And it's me trying to kind of get closer to the white. That is George Jones. And, uh, and he's sort of the kind of king of kind of the self. self-inflicted male sacrificial lamb. He's drinking beer and here's the text to uh, to his uh, beginning, beginning of a song which is called Take Me and it's just like here Take me, take me to your darkest room Close every window and bolt every door Hardcore. So no tomorrow is up is a piece I made with uh, Margaret Bjarnadóttir and Bryce Tessner and it was originally made for the Icelandic dance company here and instigated by Erna Ómarsdóttir and she, she's the director of the dance company here and, and she's really a brilliant dancer and choreographer and a, 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 an old friend of mine and, and, and uh, she asked if I was interested in doing a dance piece and then just this idea of doing a ballet, I found it very appealing, and so I, 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 uh, I contacted Margaret Bjarnadóttir, who she's a brilliant uh, choreographer and a very good friend, and and also a writer and, and visual artist, and uh, and then uh, and then Bryce Dessner, who I w worked with on other many other occasions, and uh, first worked with him when we did the piece A Lot of Sorrow with his band, The National. And, uh, and so the idea was that to make a, a, a kind of ballet opus, which were like kind of taking the Stockhausen's, Stockhausen's idea of spatial music into, into the, the realm of dance. And we worked on it, you know, intensely with the ensemble of the of the of the Icelandic dance company and to and Bryce wrote music that that basically can only be played by dancers because it has this insane counting things in, in them every movement the dancers do is musical so so it's basically movement is not only movement movement is musical so like if you do like this it changes the sound of the guitar and uh, and there was always this sense that you know we made it for for the theater first and the stage and and to have but i always had this urge to uh, to turn it into a film and to basically because to almost kind of capture better this spatial aspect of of the instruments and the dancers and uh and uh, so we managed to record it last year and then you then um then it's almost like the piece became what it was always supposed to be. It's a strange piece. It's just like, it's kind of, it deals so much with like this kind of idea of like, of nothingness almost. It's just like, they are just moving in this kind of ideal song and dance space. And the space is very much kind of like in the old song and dance movies. And they are in the uh, kind of classic rock and roll 
rock and roll and performance outfit of, of, of jeans and t-shirt and uh, and uh, yeah and it's sort of it's a it's a pretty mysterious piece and and a very collaborative piece because it's very much about like you know Mac Maca's art and Bryce and myself and then also about you know what the the collaboration with the dancers because they they basically worked on this piece for years before we we filmed it so it's very it's a very very kind of yeah there's a there's a lot of heart in it <laughs> there's like a huge melancholy in like you know trying to do a piece that like addresses nothing in a time where everything is so loaded and tense and uh, it's just you know like everything is war and then us in times of war <laughs> like it's just time for song and dance And here are, are uh, I've got a, uh, quite a few records by Latte. And uh, Latte is uh, kind of the Iceland's favorite comedian. And uh, you, you, total childhood hero of mine. And like, you know, the, like this cover, this record is called Hlunkur er Erteta, which means Hlunkur er Erteta is lump yeah like a huge lump it's like yeah it's sort of but it's also like it can also be uh it can also be uh conceptual you know like this idea is quite a lunker you know to realize to realize you know to think about the uh the uh, the breadth of of transphobia and misogyny in Poland is quite a lunker, you know, it's like <laughs> So here you hear Latte I think an artist role in society is completely ambiguous. Art is good for people and it's also really bad for people. I mean, art is like the stuff that dreams are made of and it's also the stuff that like the Nazis were romantic artists. So it's just, it's art is the most glorious thing and also the most scariest thing that humans create. <laughs> 